This is the Roaring Elephant Podcast. And as usual, I'm joined by my, in my opinion, excellent, perfect, but in his words, ready co-host. So Dave, what are you ready for? I'm ready for this episode. That's what I'm ready for. I'm ready to talk more about remote working and what the future may look like. I had such high hopes, but fortunately, we have our returning guest, Rodolf from Remotive.io, who's going to join us again for this third and sadly final part of this uh, epic story travel through remote working through the ages of this pandemic. I tried to make something nice there. (laughs) Yeah, and failed. But uh, that's okay. Hey, that's me. (laughs) We, uh, at least that's it for now. I mean, who knows? We... I'm sure we'll we'll have Rudolph back on on again. There's uh, plenty more we can learn. I'm sure. I really hope that next time you have Rudolph on, maybe 12 months from now, that we can talk about how that epidemic thing used to work, and we are out of it by then. But we're not now, and um, yeah, basically that's what we'll be talking with Rudolph the, in this episode, mostly about how the potential future post pandemic is gonna be influenced by how we're living through the remote working changes today. And uh, yeah, unless you have anything else to add? Nothing else from me. Let's uh, let's, let's, join let's loop Rodolf on and get started. So welcome back, Rudolf from Remotive IO. Glad to have you on Thanks the podcast me. once more. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, so for those that uh, are tuning in for the first time, do you want to give a, a quick intro? Yeah, my name is Rodolf. I am the founder of Remotive.io. We are a job board, a community, and a media center in remote work. We've been covering it since 2014. And what we do is to match people that want to work remotely with remote companies. Fantastic. So. For, for those that are tuning into this for the first time, uh, we've done, we've certainly done sessions with uh, Rudolf before back at the end of 2019, early 2020, where we were talking about remote working as it existed back then. But this is a, a refresher of that series and we're obviously, the world has changed since we recorded that first uh, set of remote working uh, content, should we say. And so, so far we've talked a little bit about the present and the way that things have evolved and changed and uh, a little bit around what the future might look like. And we're going to continue that, uh, that thread of conversation, pulling at that until we've unraveled it entirely. Sounds right. good. Let's get to it then. So I think the first, the first topic we had was around what what the new new normal might look like as we come out the other side of this we're we're we've already talked uh, before we even started recording about the fact that as of the end of january early february you know countries are still you know either just going into lockdowns or are still in some fairly significant lockdowns at the moment you know vaccines are rolling out globally throughout uh, throughout this year and you know, may even drift into next year just to get everybody covered. So I think it's fair to say that it will be quite some time before a new normal establishes itself. But what what are you know what are various people's thoughts on this as to as to what the new normal might look like? And I think maybe if we start with our own thoughts and then I think what might be useful, Rudolph, is for you to also share some of the thoughts that other organisations you've talked to have uh, have have shared. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, what I've seen happen a lot is that the future may probably be centred around flexibility. Flexibility being that before the pandemic, you had people commute to work and do the nine to five. And then you had a subset of people that were privileged enough to command the ability to be working remotely, either because they were, uh, you know, special talent or because the company was friendly to them. I think what we're going to get to see more and more is the ability to be somewhat in the middle. Some people call it hybrid companies, where basically 
you do keep part of your offices or your entire office, but you also allow flexibility. Maybe it means that people can work remotely all the time and visit the office once a week. Maybe it's only once a quarter, maybe it's twice a year, but a lot of people would be willing to maintain a physical link, physical anchor that is in office or dedicated co-working space, along with the fact that you can be more flexible. So I believe that in the near future, there will be an option to work remotely. And a lot of companies that said, I only hire in London or I only hire in San Francisco, will be willing to look at applicants that come from everywhere because they will realize that they've been operated and they had the muscle memory of working for say 12 to 24 months um, with people that did not physically come to the office. And I think that's opened up the option, the option uh, of working remotely and being more flexible. Yeah. Jan, what, what about you? What do you think is, uh, uh, is, is the new normal? I'd first like to ask a question to Rudolf because yeah. when you mentioned the flexibility, flexibility can go two ways. It can be the flexibility from the eyesight, from the point of view from the employer or from the employee. Employee wants flexibility so they can pick up their kids from school, uh, things like that. The employer wants flexibility to make sure that, uh, very negative thought, he doesn't have to pay for office space anymore. In the past, a lot of the companies, not all of them, there's always exceptions, but I think the majority of the flexibility was mostly driven from the point of view from the employer who had to kind of rationalize his environment and less from the employee. If I'm looking at the future, and I kind of want to have your thoughts on that as well, I think the flexibility is going to be more, not, not 100%, not going to be 100%, but more focused on the employee side and lesser than before from the employer side. It's going to be more about attracting the talent by giving them these flexibility that they, um, I'm going to say, require, need, wish for. Uh, how do you think? I tend to agree with that. I think that the flexibility does go both ways. And we've seen some companies cutting costs and CFO stepping in saying the financial outlook, it's a bit uncertain since they want to reduce the real estate footprint. But we also think that a lot of people realize that this hour and a half to two hours they used to spend on a daily basis commuting from A to B is quality time that could be reinvested with their family, their friend, their you know significant other, their pets, their hobbies, and whatever you have. So even work. I feel like, I'm sorry, <laughs> even work, <laughs> even work potentially, even work. So a lot of people are not be. I don't think they'd be willing to have trade off and say. If I need to commute to London city center and it takes me an hour each morning and an hour each night, you need to convince me and pay me extra to show up. I think that we, in a few years, we'll get to a point where people will ask for extra if they do need to come in physically to the office, because there's a price cost to that. Uh, that's not only money you spend commuting, but the energy and the alternatives that you're not exploring. Yeah, and the pure risk. I mean, I'm not sure how driving at the moment is reasonably safe because there's less people on the road. But <laughs> if you drive commute every two hours a day, three hours a day, it's, a, it's pretty risky in this part of the world anyway. <laughs> yeah, anyway. true. And I do feel like, I mean, when you do have the option, when you say, you know, I can be from home, I can I can relocate entirely because that's, that's going to be a big thing. If you can relocate to the countryside or be outside of city center, all together, then your pool of employment and how you look at it is very different than saying, I want to find whomever is willing to hire me within 20 miles of my home. Uh, so chances are you're going to make arrangement with someone from Hong Kong or from you know the next city over, but that's not a place where you're going to show up. Mm -hmm. And when you think about spending from the company side of things, if you really want to have a happy remote team, chances are that some of the saving you'll have from not having offices will be spent on company outings, on flying a bunch of people together in order to get that serendipity that you lack remotely at times and to reconstruct that social fabric that you do not get otherwise. So I don't think it's a pure cost-setting operation. And if it is, then it's outsourcing rather than remote work. So that's a different outlook on it. Uh, but you will have like those spending budgets cropping back, uh, either being local or meeting, you know, one Friday a week at the office, because you will need for people to connect at times in order to still relate to the company mission. And I feel like 100% remote, 
people that never see each other sometime you know open source style will be a something rare it will happen but it will be rare whereas most people will say if i don't see my colleague once a quarter then i don't connect enough with the company mission so that i can be happy and productive and sort of that's uh you know that effect that goes through work beyond this whole productivity and the fact that i'm going towards a mission uh, most people want to work with people they like and and building that likability often goes to sharing a beverage with them or, or having shared experiences so i think that's making a huge comeback late 2021 2022 uh, those you know sub 10 people meetings so teams getting together or or maybe at some point company-wide meeting that we you know, however many you have in your company, but it could be a hundred plus. Do you think that technology could solve that problem? <clears throat> because you could argue that the reason that we need to have these in-person uh, meetings is because doing this kind of stuff, video conferencing, it's very distant. It doesn't, very, it doesn't, it's not the same thing. With the advances, and I'm going totally sci-fi here, but with all the advances with uh, virtual reality and all that kind of stuff, I haven't seen a lot of effort being put in it, to be honest, but is there, is there a world possible where in five years time, we don't do the 10 people meetings anymore, but well, we still do them, but we don't do them live because technology has somehow caught up. I feel like some companies are starting to invest in Oculus. You take remote.com mm -hmm. they're you know, probably have 20 to $40 million funding. So they're well-funded company. And they will offer an Oculus to anyone who join as an employee because they have the vision of future of work and helping people connect uh, remotely, but making it relatable as well. What I would argue here is that most of the important thing that happen will happen outside of the scheduled time. It's you know waiting for people in the lobby. It's grabbing that coffee. It's someone is late and you're going to go and grab them and have a chat. It's chatting while commuting in the bus to go towards the team activity. I think that those downtime yep. will probably be the social fabric, even if it's, you know, some people play video games, others do escape day games online. I've seen karaoke session organized, uh, you know, to galvanize people. So all of those can be hit with the right targets, as long as it's opt-in, because otherwise you get yep. interesting surprises. <laughs> but it will help you for a time. I Maybe I'm old school, so I could be proven wrong as often, but I will think that face-to-face -face is still what bridges two times, uh, you know, what still remote work is still a bridge that happens between the two times where you meet together. That's how I put it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes absolute sense. We, it's very difficult to suppress, you know, many, many decades sort of, well, uh, thousands of years of, of evolution of the the human being to be you know, we are the the very definition of a, a social animal in in so many ways and to to sort of try and rebuild that over a relatively short period of time I think is probably a bit of a stretch but I I do think that I do think that we will continue to like we will obviously continue to change and evolve as a as a species like we're we're definitely going to get to the point where you know maybe you will you know go to your go to your home office plug your plug the back of your skull into uh <laughs> into into your system and then there you are in the in the 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 co-working space or in the shared office you know and it, you're instantly uh, transported and it, it feels as if you're there and all that kind of stuff. I think that's probably more than five years away, <laughs> but, uh, oh, come on, yeah, we've I, got teams, we've got zoom, we've got all this stuff working brilliantly, perfectly without any issues today. <laughs> it can't be that much of a step anymore. Come on. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting because we've got, We've got so many different options for how we can how we can communicate and and yet the for a lot of people the most natural thing is to actually physically see someone 
and mm. that's, that that's still sort of I think something just ingrained in our in our DNA in a lot of ways. I tend to agree with that I think that through schooling, education, and work, we've been taught that socializing it what makes work fun, bearable, or like it's it's all about the the fact that we're you know a uh, an animal that likes to relate to other people. So I feel like technology will be good enough. I don't know whether people are going to opt in willingly. Uh, but I do see an alternative where you could say that people that you feel are your colleagues are people you see often, such as in a co-working space or, uh, you know, industry professional or people that are in the same mindset as yourself in your town that you can meet and exchange beer with. And if you were to go full libertarian, you could say that work is only where you exchange your services against money so you relate less to people you work with and more to people that are close to your inner circle i do not enjoy that vision of the future of work but i think mm -hmm. that to some extent platforms such as fiverr upwork to some extent are much more transactional when it comes to work and you basically fill tickets and carry out tasks at an agree upon rate and then it's down to you to socialize with your peers and find your own way. So I think that maybe for high paid uh, white collar jobs, you will still get that perk of socialization, either in person or virtually. But a lot of people in transactional setups uh, would, would probably find it, you know, that they connect less with work in person or virtually and more with their peers. And they sort of have to recreate that tribe effect uh, outside of work. Yeah, and as you say, it's going to depend, right? If you're extroverts, you're introverts, you have people in certain jobs and other jobs that are more fit to, for one or the other. It's never going to be across the board the same, but yeah. Yep. So, Jon, what about you? What What are your thoughts on this? I think I'm a, an exception to the rule because, I, again, as I said in, the, I think, the earlier, earlier episode, I I'm not liking the pandemic, right? I'm not saying that at all before <laughs> anybody says I'm doing the wrong thing here. But I like what we're doing now actually quite a lot. I can choose the interactions I want when I want them. Because the thing is, and I, I'm, when I'm at the office and I'm quickly getting a coffee between something and somebody grabs me and starts talking, that breaks my rhythm, that breaks my... So I totally agree with the things that you guys just talked about. I'm not saying that that's wrong or bad. It's just that for me, I see less of the benefit. I see more of the the, 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 the penalties attached to it. I'd like to be in control of my workday. I'm one of yep. those crazy people that don't read mail when it comes in. I've got every hour at the 10 minute mark, I'm going to look at my mail now, which is something I need to do. And then I forget I have, but mail even exists. That's just a different way of working. Yeah. And for me, what we're doing now really works well. And I'm kind of hoping we can retain this a lot. Now doing the company retreat things, the groupings together, that always happens. Uh, I mean, Rodolfo earlier said that uh, some kind of budgeting would shift from uh, the, the cost savings of uh, being, to, being able to reduce your floor plan. You have to spend with more travel. I'm not entirely sure that's true because even small offices now, if you had like 15 people in the office, they still did a company retreat every year to, I don't know, Malaga, Mallorca, <laughs> Spain, US, uh, Silicon Valley. So that cost was already there anyway. So that will just stay the same, I think. But I do hope we kind of get to a, a new normal that allows me to still do meetings remotely unless when there's an added value of being in person if you want to do a brainstorming session it's great to have four people around the whiteboard and just start drawing things that's a lot harder because you said something i said something that it's the, mm. the etiquette isn't there for that and it shouldn't be because it should be more much more organic more uh, relaxed let's say but a typical sales meeting where you do a demo i do my demos a lot better from here but i've got my four monitors set up and i can have everything laid out and prepared we do the zoom session i show it all up i have a lot more control well if i go to um, to, to, a, to a customer site okay you have hdmi i've got display port who has an adapter <laughs> one <laughs> half hour <laughs> later so yeah that's but yeah. anyway i do agree i'm probably one of the exceptions here i don't know i don't know that you are like i i, I think as as Rudolph was saying earlier, I think there's a there's a very 
decent degree of this that's about flexibility. And for you, the, the flexibility is, you know, towards one end of the spectrum. For others, it might be towards the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. And yet for other people, it will be somewhere in the middle and it'll, it'll be an area, you know, larger or smaller that they particularly focus on for how they want to interact and how they want to, to work. But the, the thing that I, I do, I do think makes a lot of sense is this, this idea of flexibility and how it will affect a lot of different organizations. Like the, this idea about, um, when people can start gathering together again, I know certainly one organization has said, um, uh, like the CEO has said, like prepare for an eye has told the finance department, prepare for an eye wateringly expensive, uh, event where we get the entire company together <laughs> in one physical place. Like we're going to do this. Uh, it's going to happen. Just, uh, brace yourselves. Um, so that we can, we can build that as Rudolf was saying, social fabric again, because there are you know, many people that have joined uh and you know not met a single person from the, the the company physically so it's sort of there's definitely you know there's definitely things that uh people have in mind like that does i also i also rem remind second does it make sense to have everybody in one place i mean i've worked at an employer look at my linkedin you can figure out which one that has a lot of people employed there we went to one of the largest hotel rich um, uh, places in the world and everybody there was an employee of that company basically there were yeah. tens of thousands of people there i knew 10. <laughs> the advantage of having all those people together i i very much prefer this smaller scale the, the 10 to 15 people that Rodolf talked about than that ginormous because that's more of a marketing stunt in my opinion uh, it depends on but it depends on the size of the organization right if you're talking about a uh an organization that has tens of thousands of employees, then sure, that's probably slightly verging on the ridiculous. If you're talking about an organization that's in the couple of hundred, maybe less ridiculous. If you're talking about an organization that's in the, you know, below a hundred, probably very doable indeed. So I think you're, you're perhaps drawing different extremes, but yeah, I get your point. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the other thing is the, I, I, I when, uh, Rudolf was talking about how, um, organizations, uh, companies may adapt to this. I was having flashbacks to sort of early, early nineties financial services when, you know, you, you'd, you'd go into their office, um, and, you know, it'd be over multiple floors of some sort of high rise building and you'd go to a certain floor. And that entire floor would just be hot desk spaces. And you know, maybe they had, you know, 10 floors of a high rise and one entire floor was hot desk. You know, I can definitely see this, this sort of flipping on it, on a, it entirely in paradigm. And you end up with, you know, maybe there are only a handful of people who actually want the ability to work five days a week from an office and, you know, 90% of it ends up being sort of hot desks split up by divisions and teams. So you still know, you know roughly where people might be, but you, you, you never know exactly who you might see there, depending on the, the size and scale of the organization. Yeah, it's one interesting thing that happened with pandemic is that we were forced to work remotely. So now everybody's got a corner office. Everybody has the well, should you have a house where you have space and the budget and the job? So if you have those things, you could build your own corner office versus going to the hot desk where you may be disturbed or where things may be a bit trickier for you to focus. So I think it's great alternatives. And I also think that when you think about companies or even department within companies or teams within companies, you always think about tribes. It's a tribe of people that are trying to do something or move or avoid something. So. It's not always about the values that are published on the website. It's more about the behaviors demonstrated online or offline. And through those behaviors, some tribes made a social contract that it's a team. This tribe is a tribe 
uh, where a lot of people interact face to face and it's very synchronous. So I, as a CEO of this tribe, want to fly people together as soon as possible so that they can get the interaction I once promised because people that apply to a company self-selected to get a lot of interaction. So I, as the leader of the tribe, need to make good in this. If, however, I have the tribes where the promise was to be synchronous, flexible, and all the things we knew pre-pandemic when it comes to remote work, then chances are you have maybe, you know, a lower frequency of meeting and you can be more flexible and you have people that are self-selected into a rhythm that is a good fit for them. So I think that we're going to see a variety of things on the spectrum from meeting all the time, going back to the office, what Netflix has said they would do to staying asynchronous open source style where you never meet fellow contributor, but you can do great work without meeting them. But a lot of people are going to sit in the middle. And I think two things are going to determine where you fall on the spectrum. The first thing is financials. Can you afford to make good on the promise you made? Can you fly people in? Can you still afford the offices that you had pre-pandemic? And the second is, what is your tribe expecting of you? Is the tribe expecting to meet a lot, not too much, or on occasion? And based on the two things, I think leaders will make decision on, you know, frequency of interaction and how remote slash asynchronous you may want to be. I think it's important that when that decision has been made, that the recruitment part of it, the, the job postings actually have that information available as well. Things like what's expected from you, not expected, what's usually there realistically or not, I'm not going to mention, but things like how the tribe is supposed to work, what the culture is, will become a bigger part, hopefully, of a job description in the future because it's going to get more and more important. Candidates want to know whether you're going to do a daily stand-up at 9 a.m. sharp every morning or and whether they're going to be on call for problems that may arise or whether they will give and say, you know, no meeting Wednesday or uh, no shipping code on Friday afternoon or all those things that may be taken for granted in some organization, you know, there's not so much. And I'm not saying it's an easy thing to say. I'm saying that, interestingly enough, between two remote positions, you may decide to vote with your feet as an employee. And salary is one criteria out of many, yep. if you think about two remote positions. Maybe you want to make 10% less, but not be pinged on the hour, every hour, to get to know what is it you're doing with a recording software. It's going to be screen grabbing what you do and tracking your mouse action to make sure you have short bathroom breaks. So it, people are going to talk amongst themselves on who's a decent remote employer and who's not. But on top of that, I think that, you know, you may get a good deal, which is working remotely. Uh, but if you get the flexibility and mentality that comes with it, it's great. If you don't, and then it's, again, basically art sourcing. So not the best deal you can get. Yeah, I often say I work because I need the money. I work here because I want to work here. Mm. That's a good one, yeah. And by here, clearly, you mean the Roaring Elephant podcast. Obviously, <laughs> you pay me so much in friendship and love. And I mean, not exactly money, Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like, when we talk, when we talk about this, uh, this sort of, this idea of, of new normal, what, what do we think some of the, um, like some of the impacts of this, new sort of potential distribution of employees are likely to be i mean yon you brought up this idea around um you know it's great to get people together if you're gonna if you're gonna do like a a brainstorming whiteboarding session or something like that you know it's it's fantastic to try and get people together so you can you can have that conversation face to face you can you know everybody can grab a pen and draw and scribble to their hearts content and you can you know get a lot done in a relatively mm -hmm. short period of time if if we we come out to the other side of this new normal and those four people that you would you know ideally get in that same room you know one of them's relocated to you know maybe a, an extra couple of hours away someone else has relocated to a different city and someone else has gone to a different country and then you're left with one person who lives, you know, five minutes away from the office and they can meet you, but you've also got to commute in. Like what, what happens then? Like what, what's the, what's the, the next best option for that kind of, uh, 
that kind of experience. Hmm. <laughs> it's, it's reality, right? Reality bites. So how do you say that? Yeah. But I don't think it's going to be that drastic. I mean, sure, there will be a percentage of people that move around like this, but I would be surprised if that becomes 90% of your team that suddenly becomes unreachable. And again, being lucky, happy to be living in a distributed world for a while already, it's, yeah. Not I have the, uh, works. just to add to that, I feel like in the Stripe setup, you will see the highest paid person in the organization act. And chances are, consciously or unconsciously, you may adapt your action to what's the new norm. Meaning that mm -hmm. if the C-level executives are happy enough to travel and meet when big decisions are made and they encourage people to do so, chances are that's going to trickle down throughout the organization. Whereas if you are in a remote first culture and say everybody can just zoom away until their heart is content to make the great decision they require to, to make, uh, then potentially you're just going to stick to that. I feel like a lot of people are going to be mimicking especially, you know, if you're a VP or director, maybe you call your own shots, you have your own travel budget, but lower ranks in organization, individual contributor and manager, first rank manager, potentially you're just going to be, you know, weighing and seeing what the uh, higher ranked officials are doing and, and, and just continuing that behavior, I would think. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. dangerous though, because as you say, the budgets will be different on different levels. I mean, uh, I love the fact that my CEO flies to Silicon Valley every quarter to do a meeting there. I'm not saying he does. Uh, I'll never have the budget for that, of course. Hopefully. It's true. It's true. Why I think about the unlimited vacation or unlimited PTO perk when you think about it, like mm -hmm. it was unlimited, but in effect, what happened at most companies is that you will always take a few days less than what your manager was taking because they set the benchmark and then you aim a little bit lower so that you were just sort of punching your way category. Uh, I think we've seen a lot of that. So I wonder where the travel budget is going to be about the same with like the business class for, you know, sharpshooters in the C-suite and then you get other things. And it's probably going to trickle down to some extent, <laughs> like ourselves, uh, it's going to trickle <laughs> down one way or the other. But yeah, I still think that's what happened at traditional big tech companies, you know, travel budget, depending mm -hmm. how high, highly ranked you are, tends to vary. Can you be uh, in the front of the plane or back of the plane? And that yeah. is still going to be a mentality, I would think, in established companies like 500 plus uh, people, that is continue to happen. You, you'll see what they do and you sort of do the thing at your weight class. A related you, question, you... if I may, sorry. Uh, the difference between that, uh, the front and the back of the plane, is defined by how many seats are in between. Through the whole uh, dis distributed working happening now, have you seen that the levels of management have increased or decreased as a result of the spreading out of the people? I think there's a full sense of decreasing, but I would say it has been stabilized or increased in companies that have not had a remote DNA pre-pandemic. And the reason being, management and C-level have been very concerned with morale and productivity and financial outlook. So I do think that with most of my conversation, I've seen pressure trickle down into VP directors and then managers to make sure that the team member do not feel isolated, demotivated, and healthy in the mental and physical sense of the world. So I think that management is still like going strong with the pandemic, maybe stronger than before. And I don't think that remote work introduced, uh, you know, reinventing organization from Frederick Lalu or any kind of flat management structure that would come with more flexibility. Some companies were set up, so they may have done it, but I think the lion's share was just as much or more management is what, I, what I've witnessed. I would you say it works, but it actually, the, that it has the desired effect of having better team works and stuff like that. It's just a, yeah. I think it works differently. I think that middle manager lost a sense of control from the butt in seats mentality where they could actually tap mm -hmm. someone in shoulder and ask them an update. And mm -hmm. they've not had that unless they would head over to Slack and do the same thing. So I think that manager, like people manager, uh, 
a good portion of them have felt the urge to be more present than usual because they know that their direct report have been facing tough times. So they, I would, what I've seen is that they've been exerting more control rather than just standing back a little bit. I'm not saying that you should just not do anything as a manager, but I think they've seen their role being strengthened because they are sort of the linchpin between people that management do not see at all. Like you don't have the Friday afternoon all hands anymore where director VP walk in the room and see 50 people and then they have one-to-one -one with directors uh, and managers. You don't have that anymore. Like if you don't see someone, you haven't seen someone for a year. So managers are being asked by directors how direct reports are doing. So I do think those manager people position have been, uh, you know, commending even more responsibility and they are here to stay. Yeah. You, you touched on something a little bit earlier, which I think is is worthy of a little diversion, which is the the this concept of unlimited um, unlimited time off. It's not, not a it's not something specific to remote working, but I, I think it's it's one of these things that ties into what you were just talking about around management, which is I, I I've spoken to a number of people around this topic over the years, and I've. Uh, some people have very positive experiences with an unlimited sort of time off policy and some people have had terrible experiences with it and a lot of it seems to boil down from from what i can see as it being how is how does your management handle it and if if your management views this as you know, yes, you have an unlimited time off, but we can pull the rug out from underneath you anytime we see it with very little notice because, you know, you're needed for a, a meeting or a demo or you know, whatever it might be. It's a, it, it's a particularly awful experience. Whereas if you've got a, a good, like supportive manager who, you know, once they, they approve your, your time off window, they, they work around it. And if there's a, you know, if there's obviously something that is absolutely critical to the company, then you know you may need to be a bit more flexible. But for the most part, the manager will respect and and protect that sort of that time off that's booked. It's a, I, I sort of have a bit of a love hate relationship with this this concept of unlimited time off because I think in in some ways I I think it can be uh, you know a great perk for those that can. That can use it but for others who have had you know, very negative experiences i know one person for example that will never ever join a company that has an unlimited time off policy because of how bad their experience was at a previous <laughs> employer. I, i'd love to assume good intent when people are crafted introduced and implemented those policies but i'm here i'm, I'm witnessing right now that most forward-leading companies in the space moved from unlimited PTO to required minimum time off because they'd realized yeah. that there's a catch between the fact that you're a high, like fast growing Silicon Valley or technology company on the one hand, and you let people be away as much as they want. On the other hand, while still having ambitious OKRs and, you know, objectives. It doesn't really reconcile in my head how people can be off all the time if you want to be them to do better next quarter than previous uh, at the same time. And I feel like, again, same as budgeting, same as a lot of things, you look at what little, like, when did your CEO take a day off or a mental day off for the last time? What does a C-suite and director and VP uh, holiday schedule look like if that's significant maybe employee will be encouraged if there's an atmosphere of trust which does not always happen in most organization yeah. but if not i think that uh, i mean i'm french and i work in france even though i'm an entrepreneur we have very strong law to you know enforce vacation time and as an employer you can be sued should you not give enough time off to employees we have disconnection time where you're not supposed to be employing e re responding to emails at night by your employer so it's a little bit an extreme side of thing but there's some merit to that i think there's some merit to say if you join my company you'll get at least three to four weeks a year where you can rest recharge be present for yourself and your family and that's how we trust you'll be 
a great contributor to our team and project, uh, which is not the case when you say, well, it's a free for all. So, you know, here's a buffet, help yourself. And then yep. people don't. Yeah. Yeah. And burnout is always the risk for us. Yeah, very much so. So if we, we're sort of going out, running a little bit long, but there's a few, few more little topics that I want to make sure we cover. So one is for, for those of you that are wired like Jon and have actually enjoyed the, the experience that, uh, that this has, uh, this remote working has given them and they've got a taste for it and yet their employer maybe is signaling that uh, this is all temporary, like we're going to go back to the way things were as soon as is practical. What's, what's the best option for those, those employees? Like, should they, should they sit and wait and, and see what happens and maybe things will change? Should they, you know, start looking now at places like remotive.io and see, see who else is hiring? What, what's the, <laughs> what's the, uh, What's the different kind of thoughts here? That's, you know, I got started remote in 2014. And ever since I got started, I get at least one email per week saying, I love my job. I cannot do it remotely just yet. I would love for my boss to let me work remotely. Is there a way I can convince my boss or entire company to let me work remotely? Thank you very much. And for the first few years, I spent a countless number of hours trying to understand context and trying to help people make a case with a manager mm. to let them work remotely. And after a few years, I came to the real the simple realization, which is this, either you have a privileged relationship with your manager, meaning there's a lot of trust between the two of them and you can be the odd one out and you sort of get away with it. That's high stake and tricky to set up, but it's possible or, and that's not the answer people love to hear or you need to start thinking about packing your bags and finding a organization that will be friendly to you when it comes to remote work, because it's very hard for an individual to change the entire culture of the company. So either you can be an exception or you can decide to gravitate towards organization. And today there are thousands, not hundreds anymore, as mm. uh, what happened pre pandemic that can welcome you and can welcome everything you do, because I will say this as well what you want to be doing when you work remotely is to be working in a place where you can do flexible things, asynchronous work and yep. effectively be rewarded for who you are. If you are remote, but still tethered to obligation, you don't feel comfortable with, I'll say that you only won't have the battle. So take a close look at how flexible you can be with your current organization. Should you be able to negotiate that, but beware and be very, uh, cognizant of the fact that you may have to pack your bags and depart for one of the thousands of organizations that are recruiting remote developers right now. And uh, we list 2,600 of them on the website and thousands of uh, remote job offers as well. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really curious like that. The, the initial experience that you had and where you were trying to sort of help people like understand the context and like see what you could do to help people build that business case. Like, do you think that there is a, with the way that the world is now, like, do you think that there is a, a case for something that's, you know, maybe not as tailored or as specific, but a, a more kind of polished, I don't know, business case or justification or sort of set of, of content or material that yeah, an organization maybe like Remotive uh, could put together that, you know, at least employees could present to leadership management in some way, shape or form. So to, to sort of help bridge that gap, I can definitely see, I can definitely see why that would have been very, very tough, even, you know, even a year ago from now. But I wonder if organizations will be more open to that and might just need to see the right supporting information that maybe they maybe they don't have so just curious i think that i've been a bit lazy that way in a sense that pre-pandemic uh, when a company that hired developer did not offer remote work it was often because they never experienced it post-pandemic mm. if you hire developers you have had 
a muscle memory of 18 months at least of developers working remotely for you. And if at that point you as an organization or as a you know VP of engineering, whatever, are not convinced that remote work is a good option for you after 18 months of seeing it, then you know, I'll, I'll, for my yeah. money, I'll just focus on people that are already <laughs> embracing it because it's very little stating you can do at this point. So uh, picking my battles here, but I feel like yeah. it's a healthy signal. You know, we talked about Netflix. The CEO is saying remote work is not for next week's employee. That's great. Like if you want to work at Netflix, you warn in advance. You're not going to say, I'm going to go through interviews and then ask for remote work and then be told off. Like you know right off the bat, which I think is healthy, if anything, and is helping people select in and out of those opportunities. Yeah. So I wish there was a silver bullet to let people know yeah. that, you know, they should hire remotely and change entirely, but we just made the case through a year and a half or, you know, by the time this ends, that it's a possibility. If people are not attracted to it, then it's, yeah. it's, it is what it is, I would think. Yeah, and, and if, if it's not because the CEO of the company is convinced that left or right is the way to go, whatever, then it becomes a, a, a way you need to de-risk the change from local to remote working. And a piece of a document, documentation, isn't going to bring that, I fear. It's always going to be a thing of trust. If you have a team, a tribe, that people have built a trust relationship where they manage yeah. and actually say, you want to work remotely? I think you will work at least as well remotely as non-remotely. So yeah, go ahead with it. And if that trust isn't there, it's never going to happen. So for me, I'd say, and I know you didn't ask me the question, Dave, I'm going to answer it anyway. Sorry. <laughs> um, for me, I think what people can do now to maybe change the, 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 the convictions of their management is to prove to them that they can be trusted. That is yeah. not that because I'm sitting at home, I'm digging a pool in the backyard. No, I'm still doing more than mm. I could previously do because I'm not doing the commute, because I'm not doing the the, 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 the annoying stuff. And yeah. again, it's never gonna be a fix everything. If the management says like Netflix, nope, we don't do remote, fine, culture, yeah. good. But if there's a possibility, this is at the moment now where you can actually show your environment, your government, your, your, your management, hey, this is a realistic thing. You can trust us. Look at us. Yeah. That, that's the exception to the rule. If you're very good at what you do, I think you have a chance to get away with it. Like the typical example I give is that think about a CTO and their top developer come to them and say, hey, uh, my partner is relocating and I want to relocate with them. So what do you do? You lose your top talent or you think about flexibility and you assist them to the change. Uh, so there's a chance for talented individual to negotiate. It's not always in the best setup, but that's a possibility. I think it's very important to do it in the right way then, because you don't want to make this a blackmail thing. <laughs> Often, you know, if, you, if you're the top developer in your team and you're relocating out of town, chances are you'll have other opportunities as well. So it's not so much about strong arming saying, well, the reality is I cannot physically commute because I'm four or 500 kilometers away. <laughs> so uh, I'd love to continue working with you if I can to an arrangement. Or I'll have to look at my options because my diligence and responsibility go towards my family and so on and so forth. So in very thoughtful way, you can make a case that life change happened, if that's a thing. And maybe you can just, you know, stick to your employer and, and continue to make good on, on, on what you initially agreed upon. Uh, you give me a Learjet, I'll, I'll keep commuting, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got we've got two quick little kind of fun things to, to wrap this up on, I think. So the first one is um, we've we've been we've been living this uh, this remote life uh, more vigorously recently as a as a populace. Um, is there finally a video conferencing system that works reliably for everybody? <laughs> Yet to find one. Yet to find one. Zoom has been, <laughs> you know, out there. But Come on, it, it's, uh... the whole interview has been working perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we won't. We won't talk about the terrible trouble we had with, before we recorded the first episode. But hey, um, yeah, I think I, I, you, you can laugh about. And I, I know very early on there were lots of, you know, YouTube videos and memes and all sorts of stuff about like things that were happening as people were remote working. Um, I, 
I do feel that like people people's um, video conferencing skill level, maybe hygiene, you know, call it what you like. I do feel that that has improved fairly significantly over the last year. Civilization peaked with the mug that says you're on mute. <laughs> or please go it's on. Much mute. Better. It's much better. It's better than it was. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 one bit of fun, and the second bit of thumb is uh, uh, Rudolf is obviously also a part-time artist, and uh, we're going to show some of his artwork here. <laughs> There's some fun remote work uh, memes on uh, Remotive.io, which I think we can uh, we can all uh, identify with. Uh, without thinking, we should let Rodolf explain the whole concept and mood behind each picture here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having trouble because it's a muddy to the employees, uh, as in, you know, they need to know how many hours you log in every day. So I try to make fun of that a little bit. Uh, same as people that don't acknowledge that, uh, you know, it's, it's very strange times, so we need to be productive as well. And yeah. I don't know, sometimes... I can't get to work, and what cannot get to work, I end up on nine gag, and then I try and make funny remote work me. So <laughs> that's part of my morning, folks. That's all I got. Everyone needs a routine. Everyone needs a relief. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> anyway, thanks for sharing that. We all need a bit of levity in this dark age we're living through. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, once again, Rudolf, it's been amazing uh, chatting with you. I, I look forward to the uh, the continued growth of uh, Remotive.io and your uh, your remote focused enterprise. And uh, very much seems like right place, right time. So, wishing you continued all the best of luck, and look forward to us chatting again soon. Thanks so much for having me. That was a lot of fun. Cheers. Thank you. Let's do it every year, just to a state of the union on home working every year. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thanks a lot, Rudolf. And that is the end of our part three with Rudolf. Once again, thank you so much for your time, Rudolf. It's been amazing chatting with you, thank you. and uh, sharing your your knowledge and insights uh, with our audience. Yeah, it's one thing just you and me talking about what we think, but. Uh through his uh, job board. He actually has hard data. So what he says, I do take with a little less salt than the amount of salt I put on stuff that I talk about. <laughs> so if, if the stuff that you talk about gets a mountain of salt, does mine get a planet of salt? Uh, we call it oceans. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Salt water it is. Anything else from you? Nope. I'm still in a home office, probably going to be here for a couple of months longer. So let's move on to the next one. Indeed, indeed. Well, in that case, that is all the time we have for today. You can support this podcast by becoming a Patreon. Every contribution really helps, especially as we are now on YouTube. You can like, you can subscribe, you can hit the notification bell, you can comment, you can do all of the YouTube things. Please go to www.roaringelephant.org for further information uh, about the podcast, our Patreon page, and you can also follow us on Twitter using the at Roaring Elephant tag. Send your feedback if you're old school to podcast at roaringelephant.org. Until next time, my name is still in the pandemic, still remote working, still grinding away, Dave. And my name is, I thought Dave was just ready and nothing more, Jon. And we look forward to speaking to you next week. See you then. Goodbye. See how I put that back to the intro of this episode? That's oh, forward thinking of me. So seamless. So smooth until you then called it out. <laughs> yeah.